Hello everybody, Physics PhD Life here, and I would like to personally welcome to you to my first ever piece of what I can consider to be actual scientific content. And so, because it is Wednesday, the 6th of January 2021, that means that I'm going to do a paper review. And today I'm going to talk about a paper that I've read quite a few times and talked about before, as you know. Getting things started, it's nice to start on a, on a slightly familiar bit of territory. So, this paper was published last year, and it is officially cited from 2019, but, you know, they actually get published quite a bit after they're initially sent for review. Okay, cool. So this one is called Direct Hot Carrier Transfer in Plasmonic Catalysis. It is in Faraday Discussions, and I will provide a link in the description to a place that you can access this paper. Unfortunately, with a lot of these articles, there's a paywall in the way. I will not personally endorse um, accessing papers and content uh, in ways that is circumventing the publishers. However, I will just be acknowledging the fact that there are often ways of doing things, even if it's slightly less than desirable. Just going to float that out there. <laughs> okay, cool. So, this paper is actually a really interesting one as it basically gets to the heart of a lot of what I'm doing in my own personal research. And so, this is produced by a um, by three different groups between Switzerland, Sweden, and Finland. It's purely computational, um, so there's no actual experiment happening in this paper and they're using a technique called time-dependent density functional theory. So time-dependent, I hope that you have an appreciation of what that is. We're not looking at things in a frozen snapshot, but rather we're looking at a system progressing in time. Density functional theory is a little bit more esoteric, and to give you the long and short of it, it's essentially one of the most successful quantum mechanical models that we have for exploring very in for exploring large systems of atoms so typically you'll find a lot of density functional theory methods at the heart of things like protein folding you'll find it certainly in uh, atomistic descriptions so what i do and you'll also find it and um, find it being used a lot to describe things like semiconductors when you're talking about integrated circuits which you'll have in all of your smart devices in your phone your laptop whatever so much of the scientific modelling behind a lot of these devices is, um, is placed on the pedestal of density functional theory. But what you need to know about it is it's, a, it's, a, it's an approximation of quantum mechanics where basically you get to talk about the, the density, so the sorts of regions that electrons are able to occupy, and you have a look at how those densities, those regions evolve with respect to time, as opposed to necessarily the specific point-like electrons themselves. You're looking at their densities evolving. It's more nuanced than that, but I will certainly talk about it in more depth at a later point. Okay, cool. So, what they have done is they have taken a system of silver um, 147, and they have deposited onto it a carbon monoxide molecule, and they've done this in three different configurations that you can see here, I hope, and these configurations are being tested to see which one is most likely to have a hot carrier transferred to it from the silver under laser excitation. Now, this is a really good time then to actually describe what I mean by a hot carrier, as that's one of these words which has just been discussed in the, in the title of the paper, but not everybody knows what this is. So, a hot carrier is essentially a kinetically active charge carrier. So, this could be an electron, if you're thinking about charges moving conventionally, or it can be also what we call a hole which is basically the gap left behind when an electron moves. So you can think about 
Um, okay, so a really good way to think about this actually is let's say that you have a row of people sat on a bench. Okay? And then let's say that the second person from the end decides that they don't like being sat there and so they stand up and they move away. Now, this is one of those benches that has, you know, the little, um, the armrests as partitions. And so you now have a gap where a person could be sat. This is the hole. And that hole is then able to move around if people on the bench decide to reorganize themselves to be sat nearer to another friend. So you'll note that it will be the hole which is moving in the same sense that the people themselves are also moving. So that hole is now kinetically active because it's moving around this park bench. And the person who got off and walked away, they can be considered to be that electron who is now kinetically active. So this is what we mean by hot carriers. We mean things which have a charge in the sense of that hole. It, is an, it has a positive charge relative to what an electron is. And an electron, as we all know, has a negative electric charge to start with. So hopefully we're all clear on that. So now we want to know how we can create these things as it's all well and good saying we want to move them from one place to another. But generally, things in the universe like to be at rest. They don't like to be kinetically active and they'll only do so if it means they get to chill out later. This is basically entropy at play. I appreciate there'll be people who are a little bit unhappy with me being quite so cavalier with it, but generally things want to relax to a stable state. And if it means being active for some time to, in order to relax later, all well and good. So in order to get to this situation, what needs to happen is you need to excite the system so that it then has to relax. And so one of my favorite metaphors for describing the hot carrier process by laser excitation is with a glass of water. So strictly speaking, what happens when you have, say, a, um, a metal or something? We remember from GCSE, well, we remember from, you know, middle school, high school um, science and whatnot, that in a metal, you have this thing called the sea of electrons. This is how metallic bonding happens. That in a metal, um, the valence electrons, all of the outer shell electrons are able to just swim around and hang around with each other and they're loosely bound to the ions between them but they're able to just you know go about their day this is what gives metals their properties it's what allows them con to conduct electricity so well it's what makes some metals like iron well okay just going to stop myself there with some particular metals the electronic properties of having these valence electrons mincing about lends itself to introdu into the introduction of magnetism. There's a lot more nuance than that, but sort of you can begin to appreciate it like this. Okay, so in that sense, hopefully we're happy. Sea of electrons. This is my sea of electrons here. So when my glass of water is relaxed, which it's not doing quite now, but you can see that we have this sort of surface forming. This in physics is basically called the Fermi surface. It's where the electrons live. Well, it's where the electrons live up to, and we don't like having electrons higher up because it's, a, it's energetically expensive to live there. They want to live as far down in the energy as they can, much like the, much like the water in this glass. Now, I'm going to disturb this glass of water with my finger, which is sort of like um, passing an electric field across our electrons. It's a way of disturbing them and getting them to move and to rejig themselves. So with an electric field, you can think of that as laser stimulation. So I'm going to knock my glass of water. And what you notice is that I create these little waves that bounce up and down alongside it. So I have points in which I'm losing my water and I have points in which it's rising up. This is essentially the creation of my whole, my hot hole, my hot electron pair, as the ripples in the glass are moving around until they re-equilibrate themselves. This is a diagram down here, roughly explaining what the situation of that is. Okay, amazing. So this is what we mean by the creation of a hot hole, hot electron pair via laser stimulation. So what have they done in this paper? 
Well, what they're wanting to do is they're wanting to simulate the creation of this pair by simulating the action of an electric field acting on these electrons here. Okie dokie. And so how they've done this is a pretty nuanced way of working with a computer program. I believe that the one that they are using is a Python based script. I'm fairly sure. Um, I can't remember specific. It says somewhere in this paper here which um, which program they use specifically, but it's one of these standard density functional the ah, GPOR. Yeah, GPAW, Gaussian plane plane augmented waves. Yeah, yeah. So they use this um, they use this software to um, to simulate the action of an electric field on these electrons. They bob about, they create these hot holes and hot electrons, and these carriers then are going to do a couple of things. So they're either going to move about or they're going to recombine, as you would expect. And when I say recombine, as in the electron then sits back into the hole it came from, that's essentially recombination. Again, this is a massive oversimplification, there's more nuance than that. But unless you're actually, you know, doing the itty bitty research, then we're okay. Okay, and so they excited their they excited their system, and then they had a look at where electrons are going to be. Well, rather not electrons, at where possible orbitals for electrons to exist are localized. So are these orbitals localized on the big silver nanoparticle? Or are they localized on this little bit of carbon monoxide? And then you can use these statistical techniques from that you will see in the paper to determine whether or not you have a hot hole or hot electron which is occupying that possible orbital at a given time. And you can also approximate, well, okay, you can calculate using this approximation what the probability of one of these hot carriers transferring from the silver to the carbon monoxide is and vice versa you can see if you have any hot carriers moving in reverse if you're leaving a hole in the carbon monoxide to take an electron to the silver for instance or vice versa that's what they're looking at they want to see if you have electrons jumping ship from the silver to the carbon monoxide and vice versa amazing okie dokie and so, these are essentially the results here. So, I'm going to allow you to look at these graphs, at these figures and these data themselves. But the main key message that I would like for you to take away from this is that it is clear that there is a configuration in which you will actually optimize the transfer of hot carriers to this carbon monoxide. Now, it's an important thing to acknowledge why we'd actually want to do this. And we want to do this because this is how catalytic acti this is how catalytic events happen. We're wanting to introduce some sort of activation energy for a chemical reaction to take place. And so, for instance, if you're if you have some carbon monoxide absorbed onto um, the surface of this catalyst, then the sort of broader reaching event that you would want to happen is maybe you want to reduce, um, maybe you want to reduce this carbon monoxide down to um, carbon and oxygen, or maybe you want to have it reacting with, say, water or whatever that's also absorbed onto the surface of this nanoparticle with the intention of creating a hydrocarbon like methane. And then uh, oxygen is your byproduct. Depends on what catalytic um, what catalytic reaction you're trying to encourage on your surface. But in any case, you need a resource to make these events happen. And in photocatalysis, what this paper is talking about here, you are required. Sorry, you requ your resource that you require is that of your kinetically active electrons and holes. Okie dokie. And so what they found 
was that it is this bridge configuration where your molecule that's absorbed, your carbon monoxide, is in a li- is looking like it's forming a bridge between atoms available on the surface of the silver particle. And it's actually somewhat abs- um, it's actually a somewhat calculably calculably appreciable amount better that this appears to be. And so that's the main take home message of the paper that the position and the geometry of your absorption site actually is likely to affect the catalytic performance of your nanoparticle. So that's one thing worth taking home here. And something else that's worth talking about as well, just in passing, is the importance of doing these calculations, of doing theory, of doing computational simulations, because the world is big. There's loads of different ways that we can do science. There's loads of different ways that we can create samples and test them, but it's expensive. Reagents are expensive to make your samples with. Laboratory time is expensive because you have the opportunity cost, obviously, of I could be running this experiment instead of this one, yada, 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 and you've actually got to pay these people who are trained uh, technicians and trained scientists and so on and so forth. So if we're doing these simulations and these calculations to say these are the configurations to pay attention to, then we can be a lot more targeted and precise in the science that we do. And so that is the importance of doing these computer simulations and also because it's really cool. (laughs) Excellent. So I apologize that this is probably, that this is maybe lacking in detail or polish, but I certainly hope that as I do more of these, as I become more familiar with the, with the technology, with the resources that I have in order to actually produce these, um, these videos, then the production quality will go up. I'll become better at talking to a camera, at presenting, and of actually having this flow together. So for those of you who are watching this in the early days, I really appreciate your viewing and I really appreciate any feedback that you'd be willing to give to me. Thank you very much. Increase the peace. And I hope to see you on Saturday when I'll be giving you a nice little digest as to what I've been doing in my PhD this last week. Bye for now.